<laughs> Why don't you stand to your feet as Brother Shambo comes? I'm going to turn this over to him right now, and God is going to do his thing. Amen. Brother Shambo, take your liberty. Lord Amen. bless you. Thank you, Pastor Dunn. Come on, put your hands together just one more time in the presence of the Lord who is worthy of all of our praise. Come on, let me help you do it. Come on. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord, all my soul. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And everybody said amen. amen. Before you see it, I want you to turn to somebody and smile at them just as loud as you possibly can. High five them and tell them you look so much better than I do tonight. Amen. It is good to be in the presence of the Lord. Praise God. You know, Isaiah, the silver-tongued prophet, wrote, he said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Everyone say hi. I'm not talking about hello. I'm talking about altitude. Yeah. Amen. He said, I seen him high and lifted up. And then the train filled the temple. See, you've got to understand what that train is. The train of the Lord that filled that temple was indicative of the train of a king's garment. And... That king's garment was not just a garment of royalty. It was a garment of testimony. Amen. You say, well, what do you mean by that, preacher? That garment was a depiction of battles won. Every time that king would go to battle and he would come back victorious, the artisans... And the fabric makers knew their job. And they would go to work on depicting the victory that was won from that previous battle. And they would, they would embroider it and they would, say, and they would uh, uh, put it somehow on a piece of fabric like a picture of the victory that just happened. And they would actually sew it to the end of that king's garment, which was called a train. We still call it a train on a wedding dress. You know what I'm talking about. So you get that picture in your mind. And every victory, it got longer. And every time they came back, amen, triumphant, it got longer. And it got longer until it was so long. And I'm telling you here tonight, amen, that the train of the Lord is in this house. Amen. It's not 10 feet long. It's not 20 feet long. Amen. It literally feels this temple with victory and healing and, and blessing and direction and whatever it is that you need from the Lord tonight, amen, I'm here to tell you, we've got a king of kings. I'm not just talking a king. I'm talking the king of kings and the Lord of lords and everything you need is filled with this. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. But the key to that is you got to get him where he belongs on that throne and that is high and lifted up. Hallelujah. Come on. You've got to create that atmosphere again where the king will come into the throne room. Amen. And let his train fill this temple. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Come on. Why don't you praise him for the, what he's already doing in your life. Amen. And the fact that he's here to meet your need. Come on. Somebody shout he's here. Come on to meet my need. Hallelujah. I believe that tonight. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Dunn, for allowing me to be here and a part of what you are, have going here this weekend. We so enjoyed the concert and the music and then the, the marriage enrichment seminar and, and uh, hope for you that we're here and uh, we're involved in that. We're blessed by it. I'm looking forward again to March. 
Amen. We've already made that announcement this morning, and I, I told my wife, uh, I, I called her a while ago, and y'all please pray for my wife. I called her before service, and and uh, their church is over with already, or our church, I should say, uh, and I asked her what she was doing, and she said, well, I'm in the car headed down the road with a few of the saints from the church, and they're, they're going to one of these corn maze things. How many knows what I'm talking about? You know what a corn maze is? It's one of them things you can get lost in. So I'm asking you to pray for my wife because if she gets lost, I'll never see her again. And I, you know, and why well, just you know? And I'd rather I'd rather just do marriage seminars, keep you married, than to have to go find myself another wife. Hallelujah. So keep the Lord to keep His hand upon them. They're gonna have fun. But you know what we're gonna do tonight? We're gonna have fun. Hallelujah. I enjoy being in the presence of the Lord. Can you say amen? amen? Praise God. Well, let's sing a little bit. Thank you so much. Amen. Sister Jessica, is it, for helping me back there with the CDs? And where's that that pretty little blonde-headed gal that was working at the, at the uh, amen? <laughs> I already seen the hand. Where, there she is. What's your name, baby? Brian? <laughs> I was going to say Brian. What is it? Mariah. Mariah, thank you so much for helping me Friday night. She was, I'm not going to say manning the table. She was ladying the table. Amen. And then, of course, uh, don't tell me, Danielle, thank you so much for all of the words on here. And she's already got my scriptures. And, and uh, but uh, I want to. I want to just sing. I don't have a guitar, so I'm kind of out of, I don't have my cowboy hat on. But you listen to the words of this song. How many's looking forward to seeing Jesus someday? Hallelujah. Here's a, just a little bit, tw a different twist on that. Some want their walls made of jasper, and others want streets of solid gold Still there are those who see heaven as a land where they'll never grow old But I've got another desire Lord build my mansion with a room with a view Cause when I look out My solid gold window I'll be keeping my eyes on you Yes I will And I've been keeping my eyes on you Jesus distractions amen but there is one thing I know I'm still looking for your soon returning and when my life here is through from my heavenly home with you on the throne, I'll still be keeping my eyes on you. How many knows what I'm talking about? Amen. I don't know about you, but heaven is going to be just Jesus being there. And oh, I want to see him like that old song says. Amen. Praise God. This next verse is going to preach to you a little bit. One thing. I've learned in this lifetime Sometimes things just ain't feeling right But you can't live for God by your feelings Cause we're walking by faith, not by sight But I've heard that seeing is 
disbelieving I must say that it's really true Cause I'm still believing in what I've been seeing Cause I've been keeping my eyes on you Oh yes I have I've been keeping my eyes on you Jesus All of my life here below And there's been so many distractions but there is one thing I know I can't hardly wait for this I'm still looking for your soon returning And when my life here is through And from my heavenly home With you on that throne I'll still be keeping my eyes on you. Come on, if you're one of those folks that are looking to see Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, why don't you raise your hands and just thank him. Hallelujah. Amen. That someday soon you're going to see him. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord. I, I can't wait to put my eyes on you one more time. Oh, Lord, face to face. Come on. I want to see him face to face. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. But you know the reason why I believe I'm going to do that is what this next song talks about. How many knows that you're here still living for God, still kicking because somebody loved you enough to call your name out in prayer? Amen. This song says somebody's praying. Somebody's praying. I can feel it. Somebody's praying for me. Mighty hands are guiding me to protect me from what I can't see. And Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe somebody's praying for me. this next verse angels are watching I can feel it angels are watching over me there's many miles ahead till I get home still I'm safely kept before your throne Lord, I believe, Lord, I believe, angels are watching over me. Though I've walked the barren wilderness where my pillow was a stone, and I've been through the darkest caverns where no light it ever shone still I went on cause there was someone who was down on their knees and Lord I thank you for those people praying all this time just for me Somebody's praying, I can feel it. Somebody's praying for me. Mighty hands are guiding me to protect me from what I can't see. And Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. 
Somebody's praying for me. Somebody's praying just for me. about you come on why don't you stand to your feet praise God hallelujah why don't you praise him one more time amen because somebody loved you and prayed for you called your name out in prayer praise the name of the Lord come on somebody clap your hands under the Lord and let's thank him say what am I thanking him for I'm thanking him because he heard and answered that prayer amen you say well how did he do it well I'll tell you how he did it you're still here aren't you Come on, look at somebody and say, I'm still, I'm still here. Praise God, I'm still here. Amen, and it's only because of the goodness of the Lord. Hallelujah. I'd like to draw your attention now, if you would, to uh, the Second Corinthians, the writings of Paul, Second Corinthians uh, chapter 5 and verse number 16. Second Corinthians 5 and 16 and I'm going to read uh, down through verse number 18. And if you would indulge me uh, this evening, I know uh, what Sister Danielle has up here on the overhead is the King James Version. But every once in a while, I'll pull a little different version out just for the sake of uh, clarification. And uh, But you can follow along with me in your Bible, whatever your version is that you like to read. But I'm reading uh, our text from the New Living Translation. Paul says, so we have stopped evaluating others by what the world thinks about them. Once, I mistakenly thought of Christ that way, as though he were merely a human being. How differently I think about him now. Verse number 17. What this means is that those who become Christians become new people. Amen. They are not the same anymore. For the old life is gone and a new life has begun. And the church said amen. amen. Verse 18, and all this newness of life is from God who brought us back to himself through what Christ did. Boy, I like, the, I like the phrases in that rendering there where he says they are not the same anymore. Amen. They have been brought back to himself through what Christ did. Amen. Put your Bibles down and let's lift our hands and let's ask the Holy Ghost to just help us tonight. I feel like the Lord wants to reach for somebody in this building Thank you, Lord God, for the presence, your presence, the unmistakable presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the one that sits on the throne of not just this service, but our lives. And Lord, we, we just, uh, Lord, we just open our hearts to you, Lord. Let our hearts uh, be a throne room where you can enter into and sit down on the throne of my life. Uh, Lord, you're here to change somebody. Lord, you're here to render healing and victory. Lord, I'm not just talking physical healing. I'm talking about emotional and mental healing, healing of our thoughts, uh, healing of our attitudes, our dispositions. Uh, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would just do it for your glory and the edifying of this church, and we put the end of this service into your hands uh, in the wonderful name that's above every name. And everybody say, Jesus. Come on, shout Jesus. Give the Lord a hand clap. Come on, give Jesus a hand clap of praise tonight. Amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I have a lot of books in my library at home, in my office, and, and, uh, among the many books that I have, there's a reference book containing words that are 
alphabetically arranged along with information about their forms and pronunciations, their functions, the, the etymologies, the meanings, and the syntactical and idiomatic uses of those particular words. <laughs> you say, what in the world did you just say? Well, what I basically said is, according to Webster's Ninth New Collegiate Dictionary, this is the definition of the word dictionary. I don't know. I guess I was just bored one day, and I thought I'd look up the word dictionary in the dictionary. Amen. This is how the dictionary defines itself stay with me right. amen and i'm one of these guys you know and i'm and and, and you know i'm staring 60 in the face and i i you know I, i'm old school i i'm coming from a different time and an era you know i mean well i'm from i'm from way back when they were when they were saying words like groovy and far out man you know, and uh, other words. And, and there's some of these words now that these kids are saying that, you know, they say one thing, but they mean exactly the opposite. Amen. It's like, man, that car is so bad. Well, I think back, I had a car like that one time. But it wasn't like how they mean it. That means that is a great car. Huh? Or I heard one. Of, I heard one of the young people uh, looking at something, and that, and there's a bunch of boys and, and looking, and they were like, "Dude, that is sick." I'm like, I need. To, what is sick? Do I need to get the oil out and pray for some? He said, "No, no, no. That is. This is cool. That's oh, cool. So sick means cool, right? Okay. I, you know, I'm learning." And then there's other words, and you know, and there, there's always new words that are being invented, no matter how old the dictionary is. There's always new words being invented. But you know, there's something about the old words. It doesn't matter if the, it's a new dictionary or a 20-year-old dictionary or a 100-year-old dictionary. The words that are in that dictionary still mean what they meant when those words were invented. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Their meanings are consistent. Their functions are unfailing. And that's a good thing when you're referencing a dictionary. But what about when it comes to the definition and the functions and the meanings of your life? Come on, human beings for millennia have been trying to articulate the meaning of life. Amen. Why am I here? Why do I exist? Hello? Raise your hand. If you could pick up a dictionary, amen. So, you know, and I know this all sounds hypothetical, but, but just hang with me for a little bit. If you could pick up a dictionary and look up you, what would your definition be? Some dictionaries have pictures. I've often wondered if I, if I look me up in the dictionary, what would I look like? Now, you may th be sitting there thinking, you know what, Pastor, I, where did you get this guy? <laughs> you know, this is silly. This, this is hypothetical. But you know what? It's really not at all. It's really not silly. It's really not hypothetical because the truth is the good and the bad and the ugly of everyday life, how many knows it has a tendency to define you? Right. Come on, I need some help in this apostolic church tonight. Amen. The situations that you go through, that you're going through right now, 
the circumstances and, and the dilemmas and all of the and you could go back in retrospect and you could and you could let flash before your very the eyes of your memory all of the episodes of your life amen and if you were honest with yourself you got to uh, admit that those situations and those circumstances and their outcomes and your responses and your reactions to those things have made you what you are right now they have caused you to think how you think right now amen they have created and they have fabricated that your very attitude towards your whole life and and everything in life amen Praise God. It is sculpted and chiseled away your beliefs and your values. Come on, your attitudes. And if we are not careful, can I preach to you a little bit? Amen. We'll sing to you the next time. And if you want to hear any more tonight, it, it's, it, it's Sister Jessica will sell it to you. <laughs> Amen. But if we're not careful, hear me, we can allow the unfortunate episodes and the disastrous developments that take place in our lives to determine the meaning and the function of our entire existence. Amen. Thank you. This can happen. That can happen. And let me tell you something. It can happen just like that. You can think you could you could think your life is rolling the way you want it to roll. You've got the world by the tail, so to speak. Man, everything is going my way, and the phone can ring one time and it can change your life forever. Come on, the difference a day can make. Amen. It can change just like that. Amen. And I'll, go, and I'll go so far as to say, when it does, how you come out of it, how you get through of it, how you get through that, and whether you have victory at the end of it or not, is going to depend on how you respond. Too many times we react. And when I react, because I am human, because I, you know, because God made me an emotional person. Oh, yes, he did. Come on. You say, well, I'm not an emotional person. Yes, you are. Come on. Go ahead and stick your finger in that light socket and see if you don't respond. Amen. Let those Reader's Digest people show up at your door, amen, with that bouquet of roses and them, them balloons and that big old check. And, and it's like, you know, hey, congratulations, Mr. Jones. Guess what? You're a millionaire. It's like, oh, really? Wow. That's cool. <laughs> now, you know what Bubba's going to be doing. <laughs> Hey man, you know, I man, I'm gonna be, you know, and I, I'm gonna be doing car, I'm gonna be doing stuff. I'm gonna be, you know, doing cart re wheels and running around and screaming and hollering. And, oh, you better believe it. And I get caught up in a whirlwind of emotions over things. This can happen. That can, and as a result of what happens. If I don't react the certain way, if my response doesn't come within the parameters, amen, of something that the Word and the Holy Ghost, come on, anybody got the Holy Ghost? Amen. I hope the Holy Ghost kicks in, amen, when it happens. I hope that grace uh, that Jesus said, amen, to Paul, when Paul said, Lord, you're going you're gonna to have to get me out of this because, you know, and he begged God three times, amen, to deliver him from this thorn in my flesh. But what did Jesus say? He said, y'all just hang on, Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. Right. Amen. But again, if I'm not cautious, listen to me. That thing that just happened, amen, will decide, it can decide the very pronunciation of my whole life. Everyone say the word pronunciation. What is pronunciation? You look it up in the dictionary. It applies to what I was talking a while ago. Pronunciation means to declare something official. Amen. 
to declare something official. Amen. And situations and circumstances and bad stuff happens to good people. Huh? And it aggravates me because good stuff happens to bad people. <laughs> Amen. But I don't consider, you know, we don't consider ourselves bad people. And, and we're wondering and we're scratching our head and we're looking at the heavens. And sometimes, y'all, we even shake our fist toward the sky. And we blame God for some of the junk that comes my way. Come on. Listen, you got to understand, God ain't doing that to you. Amen. There are things that happens in our life that God is not doing to me, but God is allowing that to happen. Oh, you didn't hear me. I said God is allowing that to happen in my life for me. Right. Amen. Why are you doing this to me, God? I'm not doing it to you. I'm doing it for you. Well, why are you doing it for me? Amen. Come on. You got to ask Job that question because you know the story of Job. In one 24-hour period, Job lost everything he had. The proverbial rug was pulled out from under him, and now he's looking up to see the bottom, and it's the worst-case scenario. Amen. And not one time did Job shake his fist toward the heaven and say, God, why did you do this to me? Amen. But I'll tell you why. Amen. Job ended up victorious and Job ended up blessed at the end of his story. It was because of what he was doing at the beginning of his story because when all proverbial hell broke loose, Job said, you know what? Naked came I into this world and naked I'm going out. The Lord giveth, the Lord giveth, taketh away. And he threw his hands up in the air, not to call it quits, not to throw in the towel. Come on, if you're gonna throw your hands up, don't call it quits. Call all on God. And he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Woo, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And Job certified his victory. Listen, do you think for one minute that if God thought for one second what Job was fixing to go through for the next two years? Do you think that God would have ever said what he said? Because you see, Job never knew. Pastor Dunn, Job never knew that that conversation went on between, him, between God and the devil. It was God that picked this fight. Where are you going, devil? Well, I'm just doing what a good devil does. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm walking to and fro the earth, seeking whom I may devour. You know, I, I'm the lion. I'm looking, to, I'm looking to chew somebody up and spit them out. Come on. He said, and God said, have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> You're not, are you hearing me? Have you considered? Now, if I was Job and I'd have heard God say that, I'm like, no. No, God, not me. No, don't mention my name. Pick on him. What's your name? What's your name? Martin? Pick on Martin. Huh? Pick on a, old Mr. Dunn over here, but not me. But God said, I got one for you, devil. Oh, yeah. Do you consider Job? You know why God said that? Here's the secret. Because God already knew how that story was going to end. Huh? Amen. Have you, not for one second would God have said, have you considered my servant Job? If he knew that it was going to just destroy Job, if he knew that he was going to backslide, if he knew, come on, that that was going to end up uh, ultimately being the end of Job. Because uh, God already knew how Job's story was going to, oh yeah, you got to go through it a little bit. But the good news is you're going to go through it. Come on, somebody. You're going to somebody say, well, I, I'm going through hell right now, Pastor. I, I just, you know what? Don't stop dead in the middle of hell. Go through hell like you said you was going to do. Just too loud? 
I'm not going to let that become, oh man, two years of, look at me, I'm a mess. I used to, I used to ha have it all. I, my kids, and you know, I mean, it was worst case scenario. It would have been easy for a man, a human being like Job to curl up in a fetal position in a corner and stick his finger in his mouth, amen, and have a pity party. How many's ever had a pity party? I see a lot of you waving, yeah. Wait, mm-hmm, whoo, Lord, pity party. <laughs> I've been to some pity parties. <sighs> How many enjoys pity parties? No, you don't enjoy pity. You, I don't enjoy pity parties. You know why? I'm the only one that shows up. <laughs> Nobody brings any gifts. It's just me all curled up over there, balled up, feeling sorry for myself. And, you know, I'm snotting and bawling and crying and boohooing and blubbering. And, uh, and woe is me. I'm just going to eat a worm and die. Pity party. Job could have done that. Amen. <laughs> but blessed be the name of the Lord. Here I go. Amen. I, I don't know why I'm going through this. Read Job 23. Amen. He says, I go forward. I can't feel him. I go backwards. I, he's nowhere to be found. I go to the left and to the right, and I don't know where God is. But he said, but he knows. Come on, somebody. But he knows the way that I take. I, I don't know where he is or where he's going. As long as he knows the road that I'm on. I, as long as he's got my longitude and latitude. Uh, hallelujah. And no what's going on with me that's all that matters hallelujah he's trying me like gold and when I come through he didn't say if I come through he said and when I come through you got to get an attitude of victory if you're going to have victory and decide right here and right now that when you come through you're going to be better not bitter I ain't going to let this thing make me bitter to where every, every person that I pass by, I bite their head off. Every time I walk by a cat, I kick it. <laughs> of course, I don't have to be mad to kick a cat, but... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Lord, have mercy. The pronunciate to declare something official... As if to say, you know what? That's the official standard for my life. Well, I guess that's the, how many's ever, come on. How many's ever said, you know, well, I guess that's just the way it goes. Uh-huh. Come on. Well, you know, I guess that's just the way it is. And what happens is with that attitude, the way it always is, amen, it will become the official standard, amen, that you in your mentality will decide to live up to for the rest of your life. Are you watching me? Are you watching this? <sighs> Hallelujah. Listen to me. That's the pronunciation. That's how it goes. That's the official standard. <sighs> and you get used to it. Oh, yeah. I've been going through this so long, I can't even wrap my brain around victory. I guess I'm just going to have to, you know, just dispose myself to the fact that that's the way it is. That's the way it always will be. And there's no way out of this. I'm all strapped over a barrel. Amen. My back's against the wall. I don't have anything else to do. I don't have any options. I'm all out of resources. I've depleted all of my ideas. And I, I guess I'm just going to have to learn how to coexist with my problem. And you know what? We give up. I said, we give up. And we say, oh, well. And then we start saying dumb stuff like, you know, well, you know, I'm sick in my body and I've been sick for so long. And, you know, my, I got this. And my, you know, I guess it's just the will of God. Well, that's dumb. Is this okay? All right. Amen. You know, I, I, th this is just the way it is, so I have accepted. Let me tell you something about the Bible. You know what the Bible is not? You're not going to open your Bible, amen, to a chapter there, amen, and there's a heading that says, Seven Ways How to Coexist with Sin. Three easy steps on how to get along with the devil. 
Huh? How to live with your pain. It's not in the Bible. Amen. Why do so many people, why do so many Christian people have that mentality? Amen. I'm just going to have to learn how to live with it. Let me tell you something. The Bible is not, amen, a book on how to get along with the devil or how to coexist with pain. Amen. The Bible is a book about eradication, uh, extermination. Uh, come on. Uh, it's a manual on how to get rid of that stuff. Come on. You don't have to put up with that day after day, week after week, year after year, 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road. And people have had the Holy Ghost 25 and a half years and they're still coming to the altar and having a snot and ball and repent over the same old stuff. Come on, it's time to get past. Oh, somebody praise him. That's not the official standard for my life. I'm not going to accept that's the way it is. Amen. And with that attitude that that's the way it always is, it will become the official standard, amen, that I will live up to the rest of my life. Why do you think? Why do you think Israel was in Egypt for 430 years? You ever stop thinking about that? 430, do you realize how many Israelites were in Egypt after 430 years? What was, you gave me a figure the other day we was talking about it. What was it, Brother Dunn? Huh? Three to five million people. Y'all, that's a pretty good sized population. Three to five million people is a lot of folks. Why was it that back in World War II, <laughs> we talk about Moses and the and Exodus. Let's go back to World War II. Why was it, amen, that a concentration camp that was manned only by maybe 100, 125 to 30 soldiers with guns, amen, could hold at bay thousands of prisoners? Why didn't somebody come together and say, hey, you know what? We outnumber those guys. Surely we could, we could overtake. Hey, maybe some of us will get killed in the process, but we can overtake this. We're not going to let so few take command over so many of us. Let's do something about it. Not one person. And nearly double, nearly double of the people that came out of Egypt died in World War II. Four years of war compared to 430 years of bondage. I'll tell you why. It was the attitude I'm talking about. It was the attitude that says, what's the use? Guess what? I, you know what? I'm a slave. Watch this. Amen. Guess what the official standard was for every Jewish person in Egypt? One word, slavery. I'm a slave. You know why I'm a slave? Because my daddy's a slave. You know why my daddy was a slave? Because his daddy was a slave, and his daddy was a slave, and his great-great-great-grandpa was a slave, and 11-plus generations went by 430 years of Egyptian bondage. Come on. Uh, what I'm saying is, after that many generations, after that many years of slavery, you pretty much get a slavery mindset. It's like, oh, well. And if I have kids, guess what they're going to be? Slaves. That was the typical Hebrew attitude. Amen. Amen. So my whole life has been predetermined for me based on my history. Amen. In other words, my past has already decided what my future is going to be. 
I'm telling you something here right now. Amen. Your future don't have to be predicated on what's happened to you in the past. Uh, come on, no matter how bad it was, you're not hearing me. No matter how bad it was, uh, no matter how rugged, uh, amen, and perverse uh, and hard your upbringing was, uh, that doesn't mean your future has to be the same way. Come on, somebody needs to tear off that rear view mirror that keeps you looking back behind you uh, and you have to clean off your windshield. Uh, come on, get the bugs off of it. Get the debris off of it. Uh, clean that thing up because that windshield represents a panoramic view of what's ahead of you. Right. Hallelujah. And that's what, the, that's what the whole burning bush story was about. Because on the back side of that desert, there was a man by the name of Moses. That burning bush, it was burning. It was on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. Moses looked at it and he thought, man, you know, I'm going to turn aside and see this great sight. Why this bush is not burning. And when Moses turned aside to see, that is when God spoke to him out of the midst of the burning bush. And the very first thing out of God's mouth was not anything about Israel. It was about Moses. Come on. Uh, Moses, you're going to have to start looking at this thing. It wasn't until Moses looked at the situation different, uh, amen, before God talked to him out of the midst of the bush. And the first thing he said... Moses, take your shoes off because the ground you're standing on is holy ground. Somebody say holy ground. Say holy ground. Holy ground. You know why God was saying? He said, I, I want you to take your shoes off. But why, God? He said, because I don't want anything separating you, not even the, the thickness of your soul leather. Amen. Come on. I want your flesh to come in contact with supernatural. Amen. What I'm preaching to you tonight is, amen, it's time for your flesh. It's time for your past. It's time for your hard life. Come on. It's time for the ugly, the good, the bad. Amen. The thing that has kept you down and kept you back. Uh, come on, somebody. It's time, amen, uh, amen, that you take your shoes off and you submit all of that uh, to the supernatural of what God is fixing to do. And God began to talk. You know what God was saying to him? He said, look at here. I said, I see my people. Come on, turn. You can go to the word of God with me. I think, amen, it's Exodus chapter three. Yeah, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmaster, for I know their sorrow. Listen, the whole time you were going through, what you were going through or the whole time you're going through what you're going through right now. Did you know that God sees? Do you realize that God knows that God is watching? Oh, yeah. He's looking. You think God's a million miles away? No, he's not. He's right there watching. You say, well, why is it taking God so long? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, that's a $64,000 question. Amen. It's, it's not so much about what's going on. We know what's going on. It stares us in the face every single day. We get up in the morning and there it is. We know what. What I want to know is when. Sister Danielle, I just want to know when is God going to show up. Amen. Amen. But what I have to realize, and I have, I, I'm still learning this lesson the hard way, Pastor. Amen. I've got to realize that all that time that God has taken, 430 years, uh, what he's really doing, he's getting his children, amen, his people conditioned. Uh, he's getting them ready. Uh, come on. Uh, he's working it to where he's, uh, he's actually framing them. Boy, it's quiet in the house tonight. He's actually maneuvering them and putting them in a position. You see, God's getting you ready. Don't shake your fist to God. 
Lift your hands to God, but don't ball up your fist. Say, God, why are you doing I'll tell you why God's doing it. He's getting you ready. Come on, you are that close. You are that, because none of those people in Egypt, Pastor Dunn, amen, knew what was going on on the backside of that desert, because what God was telling Moses, uh, amen, and then he began to speak, uh, amen, and he said, Moses, guess what? I know what they've been thinking for the last 11 generations. I know what their attitudes are. I know what their mindset is. Uh, I know their, t their tears. I've seen that, their affliction, their sorrow, and all of the emotions that goes along with that, uh, but in verse number eight, amen, he says, but I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up. You're not here. Come on. It says to bring them up. He, he don't want to just bring you up for a temporary position. Amen. Just a little feel good for a while. Uh -uh. He's not going to just put a Band-Aid on it. He says, I'm not going to just bring you up. I'm going to bring you out of that land unto a good and a large land unto a land that flows with milk and honey. <laughs> Moses, go and tell. <laughs> it's time to let my people go. <sighs> Come on. It's time to let it go. Come on, somebody. It's time for somebody in this house. It's You've held on to it for so long. Uh, come on, are you praying with me? You've held on to it, uh, amen, for decades. Uh, I know you're a good person. I know you say, I got the Holy Ghost. Uh, I know you say, I'm a Christian and a child of God, uh, but even the best of us, come on. Uh, we've been dealing with things for so long, uh, and the devil has cheated us out uh, of so much victory and so much trouble triumph, uh, amen, and has kept our minds on our tragedy. God is saying, come on, it's time to let go. Uh, it's time to get my people out. Uh, it's time to set a, uh, hallelujah, it's time to set a new standard. I'm changing the way it's always been. Uh, I don't care how it's been for the last 400 plus years. Now is it's time to change. Oh, hallelujah. <sighs> hallelujah. I'm declaring a new official standard. Come on, we talk about standards a lot. There's one standard we need to change. That's what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. I don't want that old thing to be the old. I don't want that old standard, amen, to keep me down. The new official standard from now on, God is saying, is going to be freedom. It's going to be victory. It's going to be, come on, it's going to be liberty. It's going to be blessing. It's not going to be the hard taskmaster anymore. I'm going to bring you into a good and a large land, a land that flows with milk and honey. What I'm saying is it's time for a redefining moment right. a redefining moment where Paul said old things are passed away oh, yeah. old things are passed away behold all things have become new that's a new testament you know what's sad you know what's sad? People really haven't changed in 3,000 years. Check out, when I mean, you, you check out Exodus chapter 14, even after the people have been supernaturally set free from their bondage and they're on their way, they're on their way to the promised land. Guess what happens? The old standard, here it comes. The old definition, amen, tries to set back in. If, uh, uh, Exodus 14.10, as Pharaoh approached, the people looked uh, up and they panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them and they cried out unto the Lord and they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here? Huh? To die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? Why have you done this to us? Why did you make us leave? Can you imagine that? 430 years of bondage, and now they're complaining about having to leave. 
It would be comical if it wasn't so sad. Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in it? He said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. What? Is there anybody here that would be so <laughs> illogical to say, you know what, I, I'd rather just, I think I'd rather just leave the presence of God and go live for the devil again? No. None of us would say that. But in so many ways, in a spiritual sense, we do that. Mm. I'm almost done. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel all wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? My Lord, it's flesh that got us in this trouble. Hello? All that's in the world is the lust of the flesh. The pride of life. Amen? All that's in the world is the lust of the, the, lust of the eye and the pride of life. And they're, they're wanting more. Come on, who is going to give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish and we did eat in Egypt. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. Man, you talk about bad breath. Woo, we, you know, we want some more onions and we want some more garlic. And we remember, what are they doing? They're looking in the rearview mirror. They're going back, amen, in their minds to what God just miraculously brought them out of. These people are so blinded by their complaining and their discontentment with what God was orchestrating in their lives that they could not even see the miracle that was laying right outside their tent door. Even to the point to where they got up in the morning and they complained about, oh, uh-uh, no, not manna again. In other words, oh, not a miracle again. Come on, it wasn't just days ago we were complaining about something to eat and now God comes through and now it's not good enough. We want flesh. God says, you want some meat? All right, here we go. And they get up the next morning, and it's not just manna. There's all kinds of, there's quail laying everywhere. And not two days later, a chapter later, they're still belly aching. Boy, you know what I think? I don't think we deserve the blessings that God gives us. Amen. Amen or oh me, whatever fits your day. You know what? You need a redefining moment. I, I, I'm hurriedly coming to a close. You know, their problem, they keep pointing in the wrong direction. God wants them to go forward to a promised land. Amen. But they keep looking backward to the land of bad breath and bondage. And for the next 40 years, listen, how, let me ask you a question. How long are you going to wander Do you realize if you look on a map from where they exited Egypt and were going to enter into that land that God was giving them, it wasn't that long. It wasn't that far away. But because of this attitude, they wandered for 40 years. And God had to weed them out and thin down the people, amen, and the complainers and the murmurers and the belly acres, amen, so that they can go forward and pursue the blessings and the direction of God. Stand with me. Mm. Say, well, preacher, I'll tell you what my situation is. I, you know, I, I just, you know, it's that... It's that generational curse. How many's ever heard of that? The generational curse. No. Hmm? I get it. I'm going through this because I get it honest. I'm going through this trouble, and I am the way that I am because of this generate this theology that I've heard taught all of my life 
about this generational curse. And what that means is what's happening in my life is only happening because of, of, of my daddy or my mama. Come on, you know what? You know, I, you know why I'm behind bars for domestic violence? Because I grew up in a home where my daddy was slapping around my mom or, or because I'm an alcoholic or a drug addict. It's because somebody in my family, come on, I come from a long line. And you can fill in your own blank. And we blame it on the generational curse. You know, we're living in a society where nobody's the victim or nobody is at fault. Everyone is the victim. You know, it's not my fault. Huh? I mean, look at me. Look, look how fat I am. It's McDonald's fault. 